Welcome. Welcome to the seventh annual Strong Voices Lecture Series, which is put on by Project 180 um, in collaboration with the Boxer Diversity Initiative. Um, we're very proud to be here uh, again for our seventh season and want to welcome everyone. Um, we are, uh, for those of you who don't know much about us, Project 180 is a prisoner reentry program. Um, that saves and transforms lives. Uh, many of you have had the opportunity to meet some of our residents who are here today. I hope you'll get a chance to speak with them um, after, the, after the luncheon. Um, I'm gonna invite everyone to go ahead and start eating because we're gonna just talk from now until about one o'clock. So please go ahead and enjoy your meal. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, uh, go ahead and chat right through that. So um, what Project 180 does is that we assist individuals who are returning from prisoner jail um, during the reentry process, which is that very critical time before, during, and, um, and after someone reenters the community after incarceration. This annual lecture series is um, something that we've been doing since 2014. We began the series because we did a media audit in 2014 and found that no one in the nation was talking about prisoner reentry. So we started the conversation right here in Sarasota County with this lecture series. Um, there are many people I would like to thank, um, especially all of our wonderful, generous sponsors. Um, they've been featured in our slideshow today. And um, there are a few other people, our board members, board of directors members, our volunteers, staff, residents and former residents. And if I just called you out as a board member, a volunteer, staff, resident, or former resident, would you please stand up? Thank you. Um, we also would like to thank the staff of Michelson East who so graciously serve our community every day. The Breakers of, Breaker of Chains sponsors are people that we would like to acknowledge um, with great, uh, great affection and uh, appreciation. S the Kosky Family Foundation, Tom and Sherry, thank you for sponsoring. This is the fifth year they have been our sponsors at that level. Also sponsoring for the second time, Community Foundation of Sarasota County. We'll have the opportunity to hear from Roxy Jurdy, the President and CEO, a little bit later today, and they are now in their 40th year of service. I'm so grateful for them in our community. And this year, as, an, as a new Breaker of Chains sponsor, is the Palm Avenue Wealth Advisory Group with Raymond James, thanks to our board member, uh, Joe Malave. Thank you all. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the restrooms are over here for anyone who is in need. And of course, phones I'm sure are turned off. Um, we have a survey that will be delivered to your inbox at about 12.15. We'd be very grateful if you would take that survey for us to give us some feedback on today's presentation and today's luncheon. And our lovely centerpieces on this gray day will brighten up your home. If you would like to take one home, we ask for a minimum of $30, please. Thank you in advance for your generosity. Now, we named today's presentation The Investment for a, a very good reason, because hiring a second chance employer is an investment in a, an, an individual, in a family, and in the community at large. This investment can provide both uh, the second chance employer and the second chance employee a sense of self-worth and dignity, the opportunity to give back, and helps to restore relationships. Second chance employment is not a new idea. In fact, it's actually hardwired into American history. In the small rural communities, 
of early American colonies. Punishments were handed down by a circuit judge who literally rode the circuit uh, on a horse and held court and um, handed down punishments, but they weren't always carried out, especially not during harvest or planting. And the reason was because everyone was needed in the fields to bring in the harvest that kept the community alive through the coming winter. Every person's labor was appreciated and needed and every member of the community was valued. So after being initially shamed by the court, the individual was put to work um, again either in the fields or cleaning up a uh, churchyard or helping with a community project of some sort and that restored the relationship of that individual to the community. So this practice led to greater social cohesion in the community as well as contributed to the overall vibrancy and abundance and likelihood of survival for the community. As we explore the topic of celebrating second chance employers, um, I hope that we can all strongly consider that our community would be greatly enhanced by preparing incarcerated citizens for the workforce while still incarcerated, welcoming them back into the community and the workforce when they return, encouraging their creativity and the transferable skills that they bring with them, and structuring our business practices to encourage their success. This is why we've brought Felix Massey here today to Sarasota to open and frame this season's discussion of Second Chance Employment. We're very privileged to welcome the Honorable Kimberly C. Bonner, the Chief Judge of the 12th Judicial Circuit, who will introduce Mr. Massey, and I'd like to ask you all to please now welcome Judge Bonner. Apparently we don't shake hands now, <coughs> which is probably a good thing. Okay, it's really great to be here, um, and I'm um, very honored um, and delighted to be invited to introduce Mr. Massey. Um, just to tell you a little bit about um, why um, I believe the topic for today's um, part of the series is important um, from our perspective as, as judges. Uh, I'm a native of Florida. I'm a native. I was um, born and raised here. I'm now serving as the chief judge. I've been serving on the bench since 2002. So I've seen a lot of changes, both as a lawyer. Um, I was first um, here as a lawyer in 1990. Things have definitely changed a lot and for the better. Um, and our, our mindsets, our philosophies, and our narratives have definitely um, grown over time with regard to um, both um, corrections philosophy, philosophies of sentencing, as well as re-entry and the importance of it. Um, so I try to, as I, I always try to start off at, because we're all lawyers, with um, a little bit of um, a little bit of evidence. And so I, I went on the internet, and as you know, it can't be on the internet if it's not true. So I assure you that I, I think these statistics are correct. Um, uh, Florida right now has just under about 100,000 inmates in the state prison system and almost twice that, about 166,000, at least as far as the last statistics I could find that I believe are accurate, on some type of community supervision. So those are a, a lot of people in prison and a lot are getting released every year. Um, although we have the third largest prison system in the country, we're only about ranked 14th for some reason as far as the rates of incarceration. I haven't figured out how that math works, um, but I went to law school because there was no math involved, so I'm going to accept that as true. But we do have a fairly high ratio of inmates per adult residence. So one reason um, that I, I wanted to, to make that point before introducing Mr. Massey is because I think as you're starting off this series and the topic for today is the investment. And to me, that is what, what is referred to as the big why. Why do I care? Why should we care? Why should I care? Why should we care? And why should we take on any type of burden, expense, or labor to do anything about it or to worry about it? 
And so I will tell you from our perspective as judges that the issue of employment um, upon release touches every aspect of our lives, of our families, of the people we see in court, and every division. So as an example, um, a released inmate without employment can be seen in, in the following areas, and this is not even an exhaustive list. Um, child support arrearages. How can you pay your child support or your back child support without employment um, after being released? Um, many of our um, released inmates have outstanding uh, court costs or fines owed. As you know, that's an entirely um, relatively um, new thing that we're dealing with now with the, um, the, the um, felons trying to restore their rights and dealing with financial obligations and all of the things that have gone along with that. But what many people don't realize is that those costs, fines, fees that are owed on cases also cause their driver's licenses to be suspended until, um, until they are paid or dealt with accordingly. There are dozens and dozens of obligations that are tied to your driving privileges, not just court costs. Um, child support, certain types, of, um, certain types of charges you might have. People without driver's licenses typically continue to drive because they want to go to work or they want to pick up their kids or whatever the case may be. Um, that then results in more criminal traffic charges. The more you get of those, the more serious they become, the higher your charges are, the higher your fines are, the higher your um, incarceration potential is. Um, we see the employment issue on eviction cases um, where people um, come to court um, on inabilities to pay rent, which is not a defense. It's simply um, a, a simply not a legal defense, not being able to to pay your rent. But certainly, it does um, cause us to to see them and to have unpleasant results in court. It affects family cases, both in the family court and in the dependency courts. Um, Employment affects a person's ability to comply with court-ordered obligations, including things like have stable housing so you can have overnight visitation reestablished with your children. If you can't have stable housing because you do not have employment, then it makes it impossible to comply with those court orders, which affects your custody time sharing. And in a dependency case where the child has previously been removed, it does affect their abilities um, to, to comply with that. So the, the point is, it's not just somebody else's problem. We see it literally in every division and every aspect of the court system. Um, and it affects you because whether or not you have a family member in family court going through a custody case or a dependency case, or you're the victim, witness, or neighbor on a case with somebody who has been charged and it's a criminal matter, or even a civil matter if they are being sued, um, or if you have somebody who can't get to work to work for you because of a driver's license issue. It's not just an issue that affects a small pocket of people that we shouldn't really care about because it doesn't have an impact on us as a bigger society. So I would just respectfully suggest to you that that is the big why um, that we should keep in mind when you're going through this program as to why we should care about the employment prospects of people who are coming out of incarceration. So um, having, having gotten off of my, my high horse for that, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Massey. Uh, Mr. Massey is the uh, Director of Customer Experience at the Society for Human Resource Management. Although he's from Dallas, he's actually from Arkansas and went to school in Louisiana. So I, I'm sort of, I, I want to know where his loyalties lie when football season comes around. Um, but clearly it's not with Florida or Florida State, so that's, that's fine. Um, at the, um, at the society, Mr. Massey oversees and manages a virtual and outsourced customer experience operation which supports and propels their customer centricity and growth strategies, creating and sustaining a world-class omni-channel platform accomplished via the efforts of a team of virtual agents re residing in 13 countries. The customer experience team is charged with providing swift resolution to customer and member inquiries and driving revenue growth through new customer acquisition, retention, and higher engagement. He has more than two decades of human resources corporate leadership, 
and has provided innovative people solutions and human resources practices for small to mid-sized organizations and industries ranging from consumer services, aviation, retail, entertainment, and distribution. As I mentioned, he did uh, study business management at the University of Louisiana, or I think it's actually Louisiana, right? <laughs> Louisiana. Um, he studied business management at the University of Louisiana, received management leadership certifications from the Center for Creative Leadership, and has been a society member for more than 11 years. So we are um, delighted and proud to welcome Mr. Massey as our speaker today. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for that warm introduction. Certainly to our Honorable Kimberly C. Bonner, Chief Judge, 12th Judicial Court. I uh, also want to say special thanks to Barbara Richards, your C President, CEO, and founder of Project 80, 180, for all the incredible work you and your team are, are doing in this community and for the formerly incarcerated that you're lighting the path to reintegrate into community life. This work that you're doing is anointed. I think certainly it's a calling and you deserve recognition for all that you're doing. So I'd like to give her a round of applause. And I'm hearing that, I'm hearing that you might not be able to hear me, so I'm gonna try and get close to the mic. And we're gonna navigate very quickly, hopefully through about 30 minutes of information and sharing around this investment. I'm excited that you invited me to speak at your 180-2020 luncheon lecture, exploring the impact of prisoner reentry upon the community. This, this afternoon, I'm gonna to talk to you briefly and address barriers to second chance hiring, incentives for hiring formerly incarcerated, best employment practices, the effects of the current job market on second chance employment, a little bit about the forecast for the future and share some free SHRM resources that will help business leaders and employers who are willing to provide second chance hiring opportunities. The program that we have at SHRM and that we offer is called Getting Talent Back to Work. So it's an initiative that was launched in 2019 as SHRM's response to the First Step Act, which was passed by President Trump in December of 2018. The First Step Act takes the first steps needed to correct serious injustice in our country and prison reform. First Step, who's familiar? Is anyone familiar with First Step Act here? No? Maybe not? So the First Step Act is really an acronym, and it's, which stands for Formerly Incarcerated, Formerly Incarcerated Reenter Society Transformed, Safely Transitioning Every Person. So it's got to be an acronym, because that's really too much to try and remember. <laughs> Its goal, however, is very straightforward and very similar to the work that Project 180 is doing, and that is to give deserving people in prison the opportunity to get a shortened sentence for positive behavior and job training. And once they are no longer incarcerated, provide and permit them to have the dignity of candidate consideration and work opportunities. A body of research clearly demonstrates that we are very heavily incarceration focused in the United States, and yet the length and size of the penalty doesn't act as a deterrent. Crime, we, we found, is more often the result of one's environment and lack of opportunity, lack of resources. As such, the key to preventing people with criminal history from receding back into the system is to ensure that before they leave prison, they have the means and the opportunity to earn for themselves. Lack of opportunity, again I say, is specific, and specifically joblessness is the number one predictor of recidivism. Getting talent back to work again is the initiative and pledge that SHRM has offered and put forth for really to support businesses and it's a national in in initiative that champions the hiring of individuals with criminal records and untapped labor pool that has traditionally been shut out of the labor market. More specifically, the initiative calls on business executives and association leaders to pledge to consider qualified individuals for job opportunities, regardless of their criminal record, giving those who deserve it a second chance. Getting Talent Back to Work was launched by SHRM in partnership with the Charles Koch Institute. And SHRM is equipping employers with the tools to employ this, this talent successfully 
through the Getting Talent Back to Work Toolkit. That toolkit's available online, and we have some flyers at the back table there that you can see and grab that'll take you to a website, gettingtalentbacktowork.org, and the, the toolkit's 45 pages of really great information for anyone that is in, so inclined to consider taking a pledge. Whether you take the pledge or not, you still get the access to the toolkit, but it gives you information about, for those of, that would be interested and so inclined to give second chance opportunities, kind of the hows, the whys, the wins, what to do to, to start that process. With Sherm's position of being the preeminent voice of all things work, the worker and the workplace, passing of the first step bill provided an opportunity and made clear our responsibility to take a stance in supporting this legislation. Sherm's response to getting talent back to work is the getting talent back to work initiative. And if you ask why, there are several reasons. Our commitment to creating better workplaces and a better world, addressing the skills and talent shortage our employers are experiencing, and the involvement in implementing new legislation that impacts employment. So getting talent back to work is an opportunity that speaks to hiring the most qualified candidate, which may include someone with a criminal record. It's a non-traditional talent acquisition solution for identifying qualified and capable candidates. Get a t getting talent back to work, ask employers to consider candidates based on their merit and certainly not their mistake. Look for a match of skills, competencies, and experience to open positions, to any open position, and, de and not designate the candidate's background as unqualified based on solely a criminal record. Getting Talent Back to Work, it seeks partnership of employers, business leaders, associations, and HR professionals to think differently about candidates with criminal history. It asks employers to share success stories of their experience with hiring people with criminal records to help remove the stigma and change the narrative related to hiring people with criminal backgrounds. And thus, and those stories exist and they are plentiful. Finally, as you think about getting talent back to work initiative, I ask you to focus on two key components related to getting related to the initiative. Those two things are talent and people. I certainly encourage you to see and refer to individuals with criminal backgrounds instead of thinking of them as ex-cons, felons, former felon, or criminal, think of them as people. Mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, sisters, brothers that live amongst us that have made a mistake. What getting talent back to work is not, it's not a commitment to hire a predetermined number of people with criminal records. It's not a suggestion to give people with criminal records a special disposition or candidate consideration. As I said before, you should always hire the person that's best qualified for the opportunity. It's not a request for any financial commitment in support of the initiative, and it's not a quota-based system. Certainly not a blood oath or a suggestion that you host a monthly job fair at the exit gate of the prison. It's just none of that. Our CEO and President, Johnny C. Taylor Jr., is quoted as saying, people who have paid their debt to society, who want to work, and who are qualified for the job should not be re-sentenced to joblessness. Now this next slide, there are a lot of statistics on the slide itself about market influences that are pushing organizations to more seriously consider hiring those with criminal records. While all of them are important, I want to draw your attention to a few of them in particular. The first of which is one in three, now when you hear, hear me very clearly, one in three Americans in the United States has a criminal record. If you think about that, and that statistic has been proven true, that in this room, if you look to your left, your right, behind you and in front of you, you may very well be looking at the face of someone that has a criminal record. There are seven, there are seven million jobs available in 2019. There were seven million jobs available. Only 6.3 million people available looking for work. There's a real and, grow, real and growing talent shortage in the United States, and in addition to the difficulty with the overall amount of available talent, most employers further report struggles to find candidates with the skills that they need. So as the labor market continues to tighten and the U.S. workforce continues to age, alternative candidate populations must be reviewed, considered, and part of the process. The skills crisis should be plenty 
motivation in and of itself to begin hiring those with criminal records, but there are even more market influences to consider here. The single most important predictor of recidivism, again, is joblessness. And 75% of the people that are skilled and want to work will remain unemployed for a year after being released from prison. So I, I, an interesting fact that every state is a little bit different, but in most states, when you're released from prison, you're given a change of clothing, a bus ticket, or travel back to the county or city where the crime was, where you were convicted of the crime, somewhere between 40 and $200. And again, this, this sentence that I just said, that for a, a year, 75% of those that are released from prison will one year later still be looking for a job if they are still out. So I say to this group, the group of us here, that if at the end of the meeting you were told that your job, whatever your job is, is no longer yours, and we're gonna get you an Uber pass home, we're gonna get you a nice pair of khakis and a polo shirt, or a, a wrap dress, whatever is your, your flavor, and a $200 annual salary, because 75% of you will still be looking for a job a year from today. How would you survive? How would you make it? Would you make it? So I see a few heads shaking no's and some saying yes. I'd say every one of us would make it. I don't know how you would make it, but certainly some of that making it might involve being, being involved in criminal activity. Joblessness, if, that is, if that's the, the key predictor for recidivism, then 75% of us would still be looking for a job and without support of family, not, perhaps no housing, no transportation, what, is, what does that turn into? How does that work out for you? I suggest that it wouldn't work. And for most of those that are released from prison, it doesn't work. And so we have a huge obligation to try and improve that. The loss to GMP from excluding those with criminal records from working is more than $78 billion. Money that could be flowing into our communities and the U.S. economy at large. The people with criminal backgrounds were locked up for a mistake to pay their debt to society for the mistake and, or the crime that they committed and to be re rehabilitated. After serving that sentence and being released, they are in large part locked out of employment consideration, creating an environment that has a lack of opportunity and resources, and yet again, the cycle of recidivism continues. Some of the reasons for this, that this is perpetuated is due to unconscious beliefs, unconscious biases perceptions and preferences about people and how, how we want to label them. And then we have confirmation biases, which is whatever we believe. I want you to listen carefully to that. Whatever we believe with this, that we'll sort incoming new information that's counter to what we believe in such a way that it will still align with that belief. So if you believe something that's untrue, that based on this bias, type of bias, that the new information that is truthful you'll sort it in a way that will continue to perpetuate the untruth that you believe. I would hope that we, at least in this room, and certainly outside of this room, that we could all agree that labels are better situated and better placed on packages and boxes and not for people. In the spirit of that, I'd like you to watch a quick video that talks a little bit about labeling. Growing up very young, there was this expectation to excel, um, which was actually good for me, but it also created a kind of a perfectionist. I, everything I set my mind to, I was determined to accomplish at all times. So for me, I think failure was not an option. Well, I got married in 2000. Out of that marriage came three, three children, Caleb, Joshua, and then there's Christian Micah. Being a perfectionist took a big toll on a lot of areas of my life. Um, as far as uh, my career, I was able to perform and excel in those areas, but in my personal life, I became very stressful, um, I gained weight. What I did was I resulted to food to comfort me. In 2004, I had a gastric bypass surgery. Um, so it limits your intake of food. So what I actually did is I transferred addictions, so I didn't Eat. I couldn't eat my emotions away, so I drank wine after the, got the boys to bed just to kind of relax. And at that point, I knew something was wrong.
911. Where's your emergency? I got a baby that's not breathing and the body's cold. And what's her name? What is your full name? <laughs> what's your full name, dear? Heather. La Heather. La Heather. Yeah. Heather Wilson. I went to sleep that night. I had been drinking. And I blacked out. The next morning, my alarm went off as normal. I was getting ready to prepare to go to work. I went and I got the boys up, and um, I went to look for Christian Micah to get him out of his bed, and he wasn't there. Christian. I went into Caleb and Joshua's room, and he wasn't there, and I went back to the crib again, and he wasn't there, and in a panic, just going around the house, yelling his name. Christian. Because I didn't, it's like, where is he? Um, I went back into the living room and I stood there and I just froze. And I just remember opening up the front door and the car's out in the yard and I saw the car seat open up the door and he was in the car. And, and I was just like, you know, oh my God, Christian. At the point that I reached for him, I thought that he was asleep. And so I reached and I unbuckled the, seat, the car seat and I, um, I grabbed him to get him out of the car. And he was kind of stiff. And so I remember opening up his eyelids and I saw death in the eyes of my child. And I grabbed him and I just held him in my arms and I remember wrapping him up in a blanket and just rocking saying, oh God, oh God. And I just remember screaming. It was almost like a wailing. <laughs> I just questioned myself as a mother. Because who would have done this? Who, what kind of mother would have done this? I wanted to die. I wanted to die. I, I just, I didn't want to go on. In the course of 90 days, my son was deceased. I was not allowed to go to the funeral, so I had no closure. There was shame, there was guilt, there was sorrow, there was grief. I was heartbroken. What happened to my life? What happened to my American dream? The marriage, the home in the suburbs. And I remember them looking at me saying, why are you here? You don't look like you belong here. And I looked at them and I said, I'm here for doing wrong. And I remember just talking to God and Tori popped in my mind. Cause they was asking us questions like, what are you gonna do when you get home? What are you gonna do to move forward? What tools are gonna be in place for you? And I came home and I had them on a checklist of things to do. And I called and I reached out to Tori and Wow. The Tory program has been such a blessing to me. All I can say is this program is phenomenal. So I don't believe this graduation is the end of my relationship with Tory. I think it's just the beginning. I am more confident. I'm more encouraged. I'm more forgiving of others. I'm more able to admit my failures and my flaws. I am more. So Tori is a program that's very similar to Project 180. It's, it's uh, run and founded in Dallas, Texas, where I live. Um, it started in the Potter's House Church that's overseen by Bishop T.D. Jakes, if you're familiar with that name. Um, and in, as the video said, in the 
10 years that they've been operational, or actually they started in 2005, in the 15 years they've been operational, they've serviced over 10,000 members. They focus on health care, uh, employment, um, family reunification, spiritual walk, and, um, oh, I'm tr and employment. Those are the four core key tenets that they, they spend time working with uh, members on. I only show that because I'm not tr showing that to compete with Project 180, but to show you that there are, there are op organizations that are playing in this space of second chance employment and second chances all over the country. And this is great work to be done, great work still to be done. That's a video that's very hard to watch because if you're a parent, as I am, you can't imagine that experience. But it is a mistake that happened and could happen to any one of us. Certainly, you, to think that you wouldn't be that, be La Heather, I had a chance to meet her. And she's a new person now, but she's a new person without her son. And it's really kind of hard to imagine that. Barriers and challenges to second chance hiring is one of the items I said we were going to talk about. I want to sh share a few of those. Certainly, employers have concerns with negligent hiring. What if I hire and hire someone and they come into my employment? And, and do something inappropriate, cause, cause further problems. How do I interview people with criminal backgrounds and protect my business from claims of discrimination when, I'm not, when I don't hire the person with a criminal background? <clears throat> How are the employers going to feel, employees going to feel about working alongside someone with a criminal background? How will current managers support the introduction of employees with criminal backgrounds? And where exactly do I go to find these candidates with criminal records that have had post-incarceration training, readiness training. These issues and so many more are addressed in that 45-page Getting Talent Back to Work toolkit that I talked about that is free to anyone. Um, it really kind of gives you the guidelines of how to start the process if, in fact, you're an employer, a decision maker, someone that wants to participate and play in this space. Research say, shows that 55% of hiring managers are willing to hire 55% of hiring managers are willing to hire individuals with, formal, with a former incarceration. While 48% of HR professionals, like myself, only 48% of HR folks are saying they, that they're willing to. And it's certainly because of a host of things, but in most cases, it's not necessarily driven based on company policy. My personal experience in working in this space, in the bio that um, she read, I've, I was HR practitioner, HR leader for several companies, about five different companies, for about 23 years before joining SHRM. And I can remember distinctly about five occasions where a hiring manager that had posted a job in the HR department for us to screen and find, identify talent, came and presented us with a resume and said, someone gave this to me, would you add this individual to the process? I'd like to consider him. And so certainly, you just made my job easier, my team's job easier. I'm, I'll be glad to take that resume. It was only until midway through the process through screening or, or some other resource that we discovered that there was a criminal background. And what do you think happened to that resume? It never went in the trash. That would be a problem, and we have got a judge here. I couldn't dare say I threw it in the trash. <laughs> But certainly, it never gave, was given any further, not certainly, but the reality is, it was never given any further consideration. And what I did as the leader of the HR department is I took that resume back to the hiring manager and said, we've got a problem. Something came up. And my concern is, I'm not sure that this is a good fit for us. Are we so desperate that this is the type of employee that we need to bring into our organization? And if that didn't convince them to walk away from that candidate, I ended it with, I tell you what I'm going to do. The resume for Mary, fictional Mary, seems like she checks all the boxes. She has all the five things that we're looking for. But I commit to you that I am going to make sure that anyone we bring into the organization for you to interview is going to have those five things plus plus. So you'll never have to think about Mary again. I tell that story in true transparency to show you that I did that without knowing. I didn't know better. I thought I was doing the right thing for the company and making the right choice. I, I'm, I'm amazed that, that that's who I was and that's what I did because, as, as she said in my bio, I'm, I'm, I, my loyalty is, goes back to my roots and I'm born in Arkansas, a very small town of about 25,000 people. I went to a school that only had 800 people in the whole town. The school, my graduation class had 67 students. The first year, when I started first grade, 
1963, I was the first class of integrated students. So I certainly get what it feels like in the experience of having someone suggest, I'm not sure we want that here. I'm not sure that's a good fit. Or, or, and are we so desperate that we have to do that? I certainly get that. But 20, 20 plus years later, I'm sitting in a decision -making, maker seat and I'm saying, I'm not sure. I cannot believe that that's who I became, but it is, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so when I talk about the barriers to, for second chances, you wanna see what the biggest barrier to second chances look like? <laughs> not at all my proudest moment, by far. It's not, the, it's not the legacy that I'd like the HR folks that I was developing, the operations people that I was supporting, or anyone to know that that's who I was. I'm not, but I don't hide for it, from it because, again, I didn't know what I didn't know. And as my mother would say when she was living, as you know better, do better. As you know better, be better. And so my goal today is to convince business leaders, decision makers, lay, lay persons, all of us to think differently about formerly incarcerated. Think of, think of them, again, as people, not as a blank sheet of paper that you know nothing about, Give them the dignity of consideration for employment. That's, that's what we're asking for in our pledge and in our initiative. And whether you take the pledge or not, give strong consideration to that. Because we are, each one of us has made a mistake that could have put, put us in the same place as Heather. Not necessarily with a child, but if there's someone here that has never broken a law, I'd, I'd love to see you and talk to you. <laughs> and while it, you think that they're big lawbreakers and small ones. If you've, if you've been speeding, you've broken the law. Will that get you a felony? Not necessarily, but if you're speeding and you run into someone, like the, chief, uh, the CFO that went to the holiday party that the HR department planned, got overserved, spent eight, eight years in prison, and when he got out, he could not become a staff accountant. Now, what about the speeding and the accident that would keep him from being employed. It makes absolutely no sense. When he went to prison, he was educated, he had a CPA license, he had years under his belt in that role, and yet he gets out and he, can't, he cannot get a job as a staff accountant. Because, don't be a Felix. That's what I encourage you to do. So culture and communication, there are ch culture changes over time and there's a lot of businesses that have walked through and, and believed that they were concerned about their image and what, what the, uh, how it was going to imp impact their bottom line. Mod Pizza is a, a pizza organization that in 2017 had sales hitting 275 million and was named the fastest growing chain at pizza chain in the US by research firm Technomic. Again, they, they're, goal is that they have impact hiring and they take steps to hire people with backgrounds of incarceration, homelessness, drug addiction, or mental disability. Greystone Bakery, a small business in, in Yonkers, New York, has a unique hiring method they, that they fill their positions by having open hiring. No questions asked. And about 65% of the 20 million company, 20 million dollars of company, the company's current workforce was formerly incarcerated. In an Inc. Magazine interview, the CEO, Mike Brady, referred to them as fully functional and productive members of our team. And he adds, our history is the demonstration of people coming out of criminal justice system to make, and that they make for an amazing workforce. T.D. Jakes at Tory, that organization I told you about, is Texas Offenders Reentry Initiative. T.D. Jakes says that give someone an opportunity that has a heart of gratitude and see what they become. They won't be Felix that on Friday, Freaky Friday, it looks like it's a little cloudy and I might just decide I'm not gonna go to work today because I don't want my car to get wet. On, on that Freaky Friday, the Freaky Friday to them is, do you want me to be here till Saturday or Sunday or Monday? Because I don't know that I'll have another opportunity. So it's not just the heart of gratitude, but absolutely the heart of gratitude and a passion to prove to you that I am more than what I did. The initiative has really become a, a huge movement and several partners have joined the movement to promote second chances. This slide shows just a few of those organizations. <clears throat> Dave's Killer Bread, I, I think they're part of the speakers thing they're gonna be here in May. 
but there are hundreds of companies that have represented and taken the pledge or joined this, this initiative, and yet they may not be disclosing that because they're concerned about public image, what, what will people think? But reality, reality, there's no reason for them to think about what others think. I'm going to skip ahead really quickly and talk about really kind of, for the sake of time, kind of where do we go from here? I had a second video, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I'm going to pass through that. This video talks about taking that pledge, but I really don't care if you take the pledge, certainly not the SHRM pledge, but take a pledge that you will support this very important initiative and give individuals that, have a, that are deserving a second chance just that the dignity of the opportunity and encourage others to do it. So while we talk about taking the pledge and influence others to take the pledge, whether it's SHRM pledge, the pledge that says this makes sense to me. It makes sense for my business, it makes sense for the society that I, and for the community that I live in. Take that pledge, influence others to do it, get the toolkit, ours or wherever you want to get toolkits that will show you how to do this. And then share the success stories, the success stories of on the other side of hires that you've placed that are very productive and, ha and have been promoted and have done very, very well. One of the organizations that was listed on the chart that uh, businesses that have taken the pledge and are doing very, very well is it's a hospital organization. And they said they did audit, their internal audit and discovered they're, they're taking and hiring tons of, or several, many, hundreds of people that have um, criminal records. And they did an internal audit to see about, see what accidents or incidents have happened with the over 2,000 people that they've hired. And in their multi-year audit, they could not find one person that was terminated or a cause of an incident or accident there. Ask me about the people that I've hired. At the companies that, remember, I, did, I turned over resumes at least five times. I can guarantee you I had people leave at the organizations that did much worse, but with, me, with my standard, I'm not gonna hire. And yet, those, those perfect records were not so perfect and, and caused great, great liability to our organizations based on the bias, right? So again, we have a huge opportunity to try and make a real difference as individuals, whether you're a, a business owner, whether you're um, a decision maker, whether you're an HR professional, or just a concerned citizen that says, this makes sense for me. I want to end the, this presentation. I'm running clearly out of time, but I want to end this pres presentation with a, and tell you a quote that someone said to me and helped me prepare for this. It was from a, a young, young girl that was going to, she was finishing her master's and preparing uh, her final paper studying criminal justice and she visited the Huntsville prison in Texas, in Huntsville, Texas. It is the, it has, they do more, um, uh, they, uh, for lack of a better term, they kill more people at that prison than any other prison in the United States. She went there and she met a, a, an inmate and his message to her was, I want to tell you two things about me. And one of them is that the, the, uh, all of the guards here say for us that however you get here, that's how you're gonna be treated from the day that you get here to the day you end. So in the spirit of rehabil rehabilitation, if you go in as a thief and you're called a thief for every day that you're there, what, how does that sound or feel or taste like rehabilitation? I would say it does not. The second item he wanted her to know is that he may never get out of prison. He said, I may truly never get out of here, but I want you to know that I am not what I did. And every time I hear that, every time I say it, it kind of gives me chills because I absolutely know and understand what that means. Though I don't have a criminal history or a background, the idea that you were labeled something based on a conviction and, you, and that is your scarlet letter that's branded on your forehead that's going to keep you from employment and opportunities, it, it sickens me to my stomach almost. And the idea that, that I sat in a seat and did that is a, is a cross that I'll have to bear. So I, I end the, my presentation asking, the face of formerly incarcerated is probably not what you thought. It's certainly not the image of the two guys that tried to run off with the ATM machine yesterday. They weren't successful. <laughs> it's not the image of orange is n the new black or any other color. It is, again, the face of the people that are sitting amongst you every day, and you just don't know it. There's no reason for you to know it, but there's a, another side to life after. 
And that, that other side is an employee that could make the real difference and start as one role and grow to something else. So the future is, is bleak and bright at the same time. The, the bleak is, we talked about skills and talent shortage. There are not enough babies being born today to fill the skills gap. And if every millennial decide to have a baby today, guess what, it'd be 18 years before they could go to work, <laughs> right? Baby boomers like myself are leaving the workforce and the, and the institutional knowledge that we have is going to leave with us. The only way that we will ever be able to get ahead of this thing is look at alternative work sources and certainly those that are formerly incarcerated that have talents, that CFO, that CEO, the Martha Stewart, went in a millionaire, she came out a billionaire. How does that work? <laughs> that said, again, please consider giving those that are deserving the second chance because all of us at one point needed it, asked for it, and got it, whether it was relative to incarceration or a felony conviction or just life. Thanks so much for having me. At least two of us were in tears over that. <laughs> Felix, thank you so very much. That was just absolutely phenomenal. And we really appreciate Sherm's leadership in uh, the First Act effort, as well as the Getting Talent Back to Work um, toolkit. That's something I'm gonna pick up myself. I appreciate that. And the focus on um, hiring based on merit. Um, terrific. Um, putting people first. Also, that's one of the things that Project 180 has been working on, is trying to change the language that we use as a, as a community uh, when it comes to discussing individuals who have um, been incarcerated. And that $78 billion that's lost in human capital, that, that's a pretty big number. Um, so I think that we need to take that lesson from our, uh, our um, ancestors who were here in the colonies and um, Put people back to work. So it is now my very great pleasure to introduce uh, the president and CEO of Community Foundation of Sarasota County, Roxy Jurdy. Um, she is a recognized face throughout the community. Um, she radically changed the way that nonprofits do business here in Sarasota area, in the Minnesota area through the bringing the giving partner and the giving challenge to to us she came here not knowing anybody and she's made a place for herself as someone who absolutely personifies benevolence <laughs> generosity and change agency please welcome roxy jerdy Well, she brought tears to my eyes, so uh, thank you. Um, and I'm only recognized because of Cliff Rolls. When he takes your picture 800 times a week, um, that's how uh, people know who you are. But uh, thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Felix, and Judge Bonner, what you shared, all of you. Uh, very powerful messages. I adore Barbara. Do you know she was the very first nonprofit in this community that did a giving partner profile? And we thought if Barbara can do that, I think you were all volunteer then, team of one, and we thought we can have no one else tell us we can't do this because this is too hard. So I thank you for really, you blazed the trail there to prove it's okay, I'm gonna be transparent about who we are and what we do, so. Not only that, for, and your leadership, thank you. And on April 28th and 29th, from noon to noon, you can go online and support Project 180 in the Giving Challenge. Thanks to the Patterson Foundation, up to $100. You can donate once per organization to be matched up to $100. But um, please take advantage of, uh, get some Patterson Foundation money as well to get that match up to $100. So you've done great, and I hope this will be another great challenge. 
This community, through these challenges, we've done six, has raised over $40 million of unrestricted money for our nonprofit partners. So that is worth celebrating. It takes talent and great missions and programs, but it also takes some funding to make that happen as well. So thank you. Um, I just love hearing about second chances because we all know we've had times in our life when we needed a second chance. And just seeing what these second chances have done, and you're so inspiring, and thank you for who shared your stories with us today. You really show that we're not defined by our past, and give us a chance and opportunity, and there can be a bright future. So thank you. I um, have shared, and if you were here last year, this is really personal for me. I have a nephew, Bob, and his last name is Jerdy, my husband's brother's son. And he started smoking weed. Is that the right term? I don't know what it is anymore. Um, it was a dope or whatever, but um, I guess it's whatever. Uh, when he was 13 in Des Moines, Iowa. And he started skipping school, and he started stealing, and he got in trouble and went into a juvenile correction um, facility and uh, my brother-in-law is a, an attorney and they sent him to one of the best drug rehab centers. What they didn't know is that he then had a network of drug people throughout the Midwest from the different drug centers that he went to. Um, he's now in his early 50s and he has spent way more time in um, prison than he has out. He has gotten out at times but he goes right back in. And I just have been, it's just been such a challenge to see a life that has spent most of his time in prison. And um, he's in prison right now. And I wish, as I've said to you, Project 180 were there to work with him because he really has some potential there. So it's just been challenging to see that. So thank you. As I have really listened to all of this, we always say at the foundation how much we believe that each of us has the potential to impact another person, a cause, our community. And that means all of us that are supporters, and it means all of us that are stepping up and taking advantage of opportunities to do good and to make a difference. So. Some of you have heard us talk about our two-generational work. We work a lot at the four elementary schools that have the highest free and reduced lunch rates, working poor. And as you know, in our school district, half our students, over 22,000, are in free and reduced lunch. And they are families that are really challenged to get ahead. And in our schools that we work intently at, and I spend a lot of time there, we have a lot of parents, families, who they have a parent who is incarcerated. And just even when they come back, Judge Bonner, when I listen to all your statistics between a driver's license and all the other things that are a challenge, we just see how challenging it is for families. But they're working really hard to get ahead. So all the efforts that everyone is doing, all of you that are here that are listening, learning, and supporting, that's where change starts to happen. So thank you. Before I introduce Michael, and I'm so glad to see you again. We got to get acquainted last year when we sat by each other. Um, we're working on something at the foundation um, with some of our donors to create a fund to pay for fees and fines for those that want to get their voting rights restored. So stay tuned. I have got to tell you, Judge Hayworth, retired judge, is working with us as well as the clerk of the court and um, Karen Rushing's office. And we are working out a process and a procedure. Barbara's been working with us. We're piloting our process to make sure it works. But um, it's the law in our state. We want to get more people voting. And if we can assist them, not only for the social justice of the right to vote, but also to get a driver's license back and all the other things that can happen. So um, stay tuned as we are going through our prototype pilot of this. But um, there'll be more here on this, but we're excited to have an opportunity to um, provide more citizens the right to vote. So with that, I get to introduce Michael Marcella. 
And you are such an inspiring story. When you and I got to visit last year as you told your story and what you're doing, I was so inspired by you and just proud of you on who you are and who you've become with the second chance that you got. Welcome, Michael. was short this ain't gonna work. <laughs> um so I wanna fire warn you I've been moving all week so I really haven't prepared even though I got like three emails of how to do this. Um I am nervous but um it went down up oh like ooh. okay so like I, I was nervous until I got here. I, I think it's great that um that's how it works nowadays. Like I remember what goes on in my life. So like I've, I've learned to not get as nervous as I used to get. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my past, but most of the notes that I wrote down that I was able to get um, onto paper real quick this morning before I got here. Um, most of it's in the future and most of it comes from the last year of my life and the second chance that I, that I had. Um, I was born and raised in New York, and um, me and my family moved down here about the age of 13. Um, I have an amazing family. Um, my parents pushed all three, me, my brother, and my sister, to have everything we needed and most of the stuff that we wanted. Um, they've battled through their difficult times in their own marriage, but also taught all three of us to um, how to keep a marriage together, even with uh, flaws and um, a little bit of break time. So um, when I got to Project 180, I got there on December 14th of 2018. Um, it was my first time actually coming out of jail and having somewhere to go. Um, If I can remember correctly, like I got out of jail and it was mid-August and um, I actually got a second chance from an employee or that I had worked for in the past and um, it was for roofing and it was the middle of August and I just got out of jail and like six foot three on a slanted roof doesn't really work good in Florida. So, um, I did that for about three months and stayed clean doing it for three months. And um, at that time, I, I fell back into the gutter. And um, I want to thank anybody that's here from the Salvation Army because that place saved my life. Um, I, w I wasn't able to complete that, like up to date to till today. Like Project 180 is the only program or anything that I've, I've ever been able to complete in my lifetime. Um, and that, that holds some somewhere in my heart, and I, I hope that I can continue to be a part of Project 180, because this is the first completion mark like in my lifetime. <laughs> so, December 14th, 2018, um, I was DQ'd from the Salvation Army, and. Um, I didn't have many belongings then. Um, now that I just got done moving, <laughs> I have a lot more now. <laughs> and I, I'm hoping that it stays where it is because if I ever have to move again, I don't want to move all my shit. <laughs> oh. So, uh, <laughs> no cursing, that was one of the rules. <laughs> I, I don't like rules, so. <laughs> um, the difference, this time around was I had um, enough knowledge from the Salvation Army to know that I needed to go to a meeting. Um, so when I got out, that was the first place I, I went, was in, to an NA meeting with all my belongings. And at that time, the current house manager and uh, leader were both there for Project 180. And they asked me what I was doing with everything I owned on my back. And I said, looking for a place to live so that I don't go back to what I was doing before. Um, I tried to get clean and before the Salvation Army. Um, just 
bring you back like um, I'm not going to go into all the details because everybody pretty much like drugs does the same thing to people we end up in jail we either die or we we go into an ins institution for a while um, but my last go out um, I ended up with a fourteen thousand dollar medical bill from Sarasota Memorial and um, I was behind recognition when I went to get these services and quite frankly I don't even remember getting treated and um, that's a big thing that's done being my future for a while now and it's all because I thought I could do this one more time I could I could use successfully I had a good job I was making good money I didn't have a roof over my head but in my in my past seven years the only roof that I did have over my head was in jail or at the Salvation Army so um, it became a common ground to not to not have the roof and and learning the survival skills to live in the streets of Sarasota and knowing where to be at the right time to get fed and 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 to survive and then to maintain my drug habit maintain a job somehow even though I really didn't have the necessities of a, a life to maintain a job. Somehow I managed to do so. Um, when I met that, um, no question. Uh, when I met that whooping that I got and, and that sent me into the hospital, um, when I got out, I showed up at the Salvation Army pretty much in boxers and, and flip flops. And that's all I owned. Um, they were able to, through the clothes closet there, get me a couple pairs of clothing, a pair of shoes, and um, really nice dress clothes. So now, whenever I'm asked to dress up, which is every Sunday for church, like I'm really <laughs> equipped for that. So it, it gets exciting. I, um, I've always been able to dress up. I was always good at dressing up. Um, like I said, my family was really good, good to me. Um, I got to visit them this weekend. Um, there goes that home word, Jeremy. Uh, it it's a hard it's a hard relationship that I'm taking a lot of time to rebuild. When I first got to Project 180, I wanted it right away. I wanted that relationship back with my mom and dad right away. And Barbara looked at me and she said, "Time, just give it time." And then uh, my recent, recent named sponsor, who's the house manager still, Mike Southwick, told me, let it come to you. Don't go and chase it. So that's what I did. Um, Christmas was the first time I've seen my mom in, in several years clean. Um, I would always say I was clean, and I would always show up at the house, and she knew I wasn't clean. Um, Saturday, I got to unpack a lot of my belongings, and um, I came across a couple things that reminded her that I tried to get clean before. I had a 30-day 30, 30 key tag and a, and a one-day key tag in a box that we unloaded. And uh, she looked at me and she goes, you know you were shooting heroin that whole time and going to meetings, right? I was like, I don't even remember going to the meetings. So, um, to see that she still welcomes me at, my, at her house and uh, the help and assistance that she gives me today, it's a remarkable accomplishment to say that, that anything's possible because um, in 2016 she told me I was dead to her and I, re I exchanged the same words but right back at her like I, I don't need you and I don't want you in my life and we went back and forth through a really, really um, bad falling out. Um, with time, I hope to totally um, get that relationship back, but where it's at today, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, Project 180s, when I first got there, um, it, was, it was joyful. Um, this topic's on self, second chance and employment, so, I, I stayed there a whole month, and Barbara let me slide 
on a whole month of not being able to provide for my program fee for any kind of anything like I ate I showered I got I got all the necessities of life until I found an employee or employer or that um, would hire me and um, it was at Hooters and it, it was great for me but bad for my recovery um, it, it was a task every day going to work one because like my addiction's worse than just the drugs like you put me around women and like I'm nervous up here but when you put me around women some some odd reason I'm not nervous at all um they taught me a thing or two though they, they definitely taught me how to talk to a woman um I learned real quick that like my my slick remarks weren't gonna be tolerated and um damn one minute I need like 30 <laughs> more rules. So um, let me skip through all that. And uh, I went back to roofing. Um, <laughs> great idea. Um, which I believe they're part of the second chance employment. Um, I know they do a lot of help with the re um, recovery community. Um, but again, instead of going back out this time, I chose to better myself in my better, better situation and went to school with Barber's help and Project, Project 180's help. Um, because I was in transitional housing, my tuition was covered. And uh, they also let me fall behind once again until I was able to catch back up. Um, I wasn't able to complete school, but I was able to get enough done that my teacher reached out and found me a job, which I currently hold today. Um, I'm an electrician now, um, an apprentice, and uh, it's the first time I've held a job for more than six months that I wake up every morning wanting to go to. Um, through the time at Project 180, I've been able to get my license back, um, kill all my court fees, pay off all the courts, all the restitution, anything I've ever owed them to prevent myself to, from a going back to jail because of fees. Um, I was able to buy a car, which is paid off, and I actually have insurance on a car. Um, last Thursday, I was able to put enough money together to get my first apartment in seven years. Uh, I live with my wonderful girlfriend who's kept me sane for like the last six months through um, to switch over for the job and then to switch over of needing to move on with my life and getting into a place. It's so much easier to make that transition when you have a partner and a teammate instead of moving in all alone. Um, I have medical, dental, and vis vision insurance now. That's something I've never had in my life. Um, most of that comes from the medical bill I got from Sarasota Memorial. <laughs> I don't want those bills anymore, and um, I, I'm pretty sure that with insurance, they might not be that high. Um, I've met a lot of great people being at Project 180. Um, Ed Broski, the Brunswick Foundation that has completely changed um, Project 180 for the better with everything they have done. Um, I've met some great guys, uh, Jeremy, Mike Southwick, Matt Tilka, and the guys that reside at the house now, Garrett, um, they've taught me that I can put trust into a man again because my dad tried to kind of ruin that for me for a little while. Um, I'm learning to be open with how I feel and uh, it's helped me in my life and people tend to want to help the people that want to help. So I'm, I'm continued to learn how to ask for help and, and let down my pride. Um, the next step of my life is uh, definitely to squash what I ruined with my credit um, and also to, to keep doing the right thing the next step forward. And um, with that, I'll close. Um, Every day, every person who draws breath on this earth receives the same amount of time, 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, or 86 
1,400 seconds, whichever denomination you prefer. At the end of the day, everybody's allotment is depleted. Time can't be rolled over, stockpiled, or saved. When it's gone, it's gone. Time can't be stolen or transferred into another account. It's a market that can't be cor uh, cornered. Time can't be exchanged or refunded. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody here that's given me the time to speak today and for attending this luncheon. And with the time that you have spent here, I hope you continue to envision uh, Project 180 in the future and continue to support the cause that Barber started with this community and so many other ones. Um, without that and without everybody's compassion, care, and support in this room, I probably wouldn't be standing here. And that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you. So I would like to let you know what it takes to graduate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what it takes to graduate from Project 180. And Jeremy Larson, I'd like to invite you to come up here as well, please. So this is what someone must accomplish. <clears throat> I need to have maintained full-time employment. This is Jeremy Larson. <laughs> and these two gentlemen have graduated from Project 180. So they need to have paid their program fee on time, maintained full-time employment, maintained sobriety, refrained from physical or verbal violence, obtained a reliable mode of transportation, participated in mandatory Project 180 activities, and interacted positively with the greater community. And there are probably a few other things. They have to learn how to tie a tie, <laughs> which they've done. That's and for the future. A few other things as well. Um, but these two gentlemen are our are, are graduates, our recent graduates, and we are so very, very proud of them. Wendy Cox, and she has a few words to say. Yes, I have a few words to say. Jeremy and Michael, congratulations. And thank you, Michael, for sharing your story with us here today. It means a lot to hear how somebody has benefited from the programs of Project 180 and really pulled your life together. So I think I can speak for everybody when I say we're all very proud of what you've accomplished in your life. So thank you for that. So my name is Wendy Cox, and my husband um, Jim and I are supporters of Project 180. Um, we're financial supporters, we're members of the Founders Circle and sponsors here at the lunch today, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, now we're done with all the learning and all the listening and taking in all the great things that Project 180 has done. It's time now for audience participation. And Roxy, I want to thank you for warming up this audience for me for what's about to happen next. So I know, like myself, all of you want to do something about this. You want to be part of a solution. You want to be a better informed citizen. And you want to give people like Michael a chance to start over and support that chance. And I'm going to tell you how you can do that. It's all on this little card. You all have a card on your table with a blue envelope. So I want you to just reach for your card because now we're going to change this um, lecture format into a workshop. And this workshop can be about 60 seconds or I can drag this out for about another hour. <laughs> so if you want to grab your response card, we'll get it done faster. And there's also pens on your table and I feel that people are often reluctant to grab the response card and the pen, and maybe especially now you're reluctant to grab this pen. But I want to assure you, these pens have been sanitized in Purell. <laughs> so they're safe to use here today. 
So if you look on your response card on the front, there's opportunities for you to make a donation. And that's probably the easiest and fastest way for you to support Project 180 here today, is to make a donation. And you can see on the card, you can fill out your credit card information, which uh, you can also write a check if any of you still carry around checkbooks. I'm not sure if you do or not, most people don't. I like to use a credit card because it feels like you're not even spending money. So I highly recommend that you do that. Um, and I say my motto is donate now and deal with it later. So I encourage you all to live by that here today. The bill will come much later. You can just go ahead and feel free to donate on your credit card. And you can do it by filling in the response card on the front. And also I believe if you want to swipe your card at the back, you can bring your credit card to the um, registration table and they would be happy to take your donation here today. Why put it off? You're here today. Now I also want to let you know that we have a very generous grant, um, a matching grant of $20,000 from the Imagine Foundation and Olivia Weinberger. We want to thank those donors for making this matching grant of $20,000. And we have raised a lot of that money. We have $4,500 left to raise. And this money is designated for opening a second residential program so that individuals like Michael get a place to live while they are getting a second chance at life. So if you make a donation today, it can be used towards that $4,500 we have yet to raise. I'm pretty sure that if you made the, do the donation tomorrow, it would also apply. But why not just get this over with and move on with your life? And if you want to do more than just make a gift, you can flip over the back of your card. There's a couple opportunities for you to um, volunteer. Um, financial literacy instructors, they need financial literacy instructors. You can talk to Barbara to get specifics on what that involves. Um, or you can be a workforce educator. And of course, we want you to come back to the next two lunches in our series. And the dates for those lunches are, drum roll please. April 3rd and May 8th. We've got a couple um, additional fabulous speakers um, that are gonna come to join us and talk about um, what's happening in the community. And so I invite you to join us and bring a friend and introduce them to Project 180 so that we can make this room triple the size it was. If everybody brings a couple friends, we'll get more and more people involved to hear about the great work that Project 180 and Barbara has, have done in our community. So finally, I just wanna thank you for coming. Thank you for making a donation. Thank you for supporting the organization by being a sponsor. You may have donated throughout the year. You came today. You may have filled a table and brought friends. We appreciate that very much. And while you're filling out the busy work, and I can see you're all very busy on the response cards, I'm going to invite Barbara to come back up and say a few closing remarks before we all go home. Isn't Wendy the most terrific fundraiser you have ever heard or met? <laughs> She's fabulous. And we really thank you, Wendy, for bringing attention to the purpose of what we're doing here today and um, our gratitude for everyone's generous support. We are very grateful for you being here. We're going to close in about two minutes. Um, and I wanted to let everyone know that if you are here for CLE credit, this is your moment. So you want to write this down with that pen that you've been so busily using on your response card. Um, the number is 2000 894 n So this is, these are continuing legal education credits. For being here today, 2000-894-N as in Nancy. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you on April 3rd for the panel discussion, which is being moderated by uh, Judge uh, Charles Williams, who was the, a former chief, the former chief judge and a panel of employers and employees who are all second chancers. Um, then on May 8th, uh, Dave Dahl, who is the namesake of Dave's Killer Bread. If you haven't tried it yet, go to Publix or Costco and grab a loaf. It's really delicious. Um, and he's here to talk to us about his experiences, both in the system and afterwards um, when he became a second chance employer his, himself. Uh, please remember that our centerpieces on this gray day need a really, um, they need good homes. Um, and uh, we can ring you up back at the registration desk. And um, I think that that's everything. And thank you all so much for being here today and for your great attention 
and for all of our wonderful speakers. We really appreciate you, and thank you so much. Thank you.